Chapter 11, Harder Than You Thought Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 1500H Natasha just pulled into Motel 6 parking. She still can't believe she got out of Bianchi's place without a fight, but she won't look a gift horse in the mouth. She got out of her car and went to the front desk. She pulled out a fake FBI badge showed it to the person at the front desk. Good afternoon. I'm Special Agent Naomi Ryan. I'm here to ask some questions. Natasha took out a photo of Naruto and showed it. Have you seen this guy? She said in an authoritative tone. OMG. Is he a criminal? Please say he's not. What if he's a serial killer and I'm his next target? The receptionist said, clearly losing her cool. Ma'am, ma'am. Natasha said, trying to calm the receptionist down. He's not a criminal. He's a missing person, and his family has been looking for him for over a month. One of my contacts said he spotted him leave this motel. Is this true? The receptionist took a deep breath to calm down. After a few deep breaths and said, Yes, he, he just checked out around two hours ago. Did he say where he was going? Not really. But, he did ask where he could play some poker. I told him he could go to the Bellagio, so he could go there. Thank you for your cooperation. Have a great day. Natasha pocketed her FBI badge and the photo and left. Natasha went back to her hotel to change into something more appropriate. She checked her car to the valet and went up to her room. As soon as she locked the door, she swept the room again for bugs. Better be safe than sorry, and in her profession, being sorry might mean you die. When she got the all clear, she took out her laptop and video called Fury. Good afternoon, boss. I got a lead on the guy. Natasha said with enthusiasm. Forget about him, Romanoff. I'm cutting your vacation short. I need you on the next flight to New York two hours ago. Fury ordered. Why? Did something happen? You could say that. Coulson just classified the 083 event as a possible 051. First contact? We have evidence? Nothing concrete as of yet. Only some markings on a tree are indicating that it's a bridge to bring someone in. The tree is a bridge? Natasha said, her confusion seeping through while she started packing up her stuff. Trees. Plural. Coulson would explain it better. That's why I want you and Barton to lead the search teams to confirm if there's a motherfucking alien in my goddamn planet. Fury exclaimed. Natasha hesitated for a moment seeing her boss so agitated, but she steeled herself and said, Boss, I'll take a transport from Nevada field office to New York at midnight so that I can be in New York by morning. Why the hold up? Is this still about the hitchhiker? Didn't just I tell you to forget about him? Boss, I have a reason to believe he's a possible enhance and he's already trained. I already sent you a copy of the underground fights he won last night. Natasha could see Fury rubbing his head while opening the email she sent him. She could see a slight widening of Fury's eye while watching the video, which in Fury's case might as well be dropping his jaw. A few more moments passed before Fury spoke up. All right. You can do what you want, but I want you in New York first thing tomorrow morning. Try to see if he's amenable to joining us. In the meantime, I'll have a team analyze the footage to have an idea on the guy's capabilities. Thanks, boss. Natasha closed her laptop to finish packing her stuff at the same time, picking out a practical yet appropriate outfit to where she's going. She removed her weapons and stripped down to her lace underwear to take a bath. When Natasha got out 30 minutes later wearing only a towel, she checked her phone. 
Well, that was fast. Natasha said, referring to the preliminary analysis of the video. The analysis of Naruto's capabilities is based on approximated data available in the video. The speed is computed using the approximated distance traveled and frames per second. The computation for strength uses the opponent's approximated metrics and calculating the force needed for a person to fly that far. The amount of damage Naruto can take, on the other hand, is a little harder to approximate since no reaction could be seen on Naruto. The result of the analysis is simply staggering. Natasha immediately dialed Fury's number. The call quickly went through. I take it you saw the report. Fury said in a serious voice. Is this right? I already thought his specs are extraordinary, but not this. Looks like you're right again, Romanoff. But that's not all. I'll send you another file. It's an old report of an analysis of a video. Compare the numbers. Natasha immediately went to her email and read the report. Her jaw dropped when she finally saw the name on the bottom. Boss, he's better than the captain? Natasha asked hesitantly. In terms of strength and speed, definitely yes. The guy didn't even take the fights seriously. He might be a lot faster and stronger. In fact, I'll bet on it. It's like he's picking on kids. Fury said with a smile. The other things Cap had, though, we have no idea. Only the lab can test for that. He certainly looks like he has experience fighting. The there was a lull in the conversation until Natasha asked the thought that's running to both of their minds. Is this as bad as I think it is? The fact that someone may have managed to recreate a super soldier serum without even chatter about it. It's, it's really worrying. The fact that he might have worked as a contract killer is another negative. We might have another winter soldier scenario in our hands. Fury finished his thought. Keep me updated, Romanoff. We have too many unknowns about this guy. The fact that New York is still not resolved, and we just had the green signal to study the cube, we have too many things happening on our plate. Natasha shuddered, just remembering the machine of a man who killed her client. Right, boss. I'll find him. Happy hunting Romanoff. I still want you in New York in the morning. Fury said before hanging up the phone. Natasha tossed her phone on the bed and changed into her chosen attire. She double-checked the room for possible things she might leave and went down to the front desk to check out. Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 29, 2005, 2230H local. Natasha had spent just spent three hours, from four to seven, looking around the Bellagio for Naruto to no avail. Seeing no sign that Naruto would show up, she went around all the major casinos in the city looking for any sign of him. She paid especially close attention to the poker tables, since that was the only lead she got from the receptionist. Running out of time since she needed to be on the tarmac of the Shield Nevada field office, by 12 to reach New York on time, she went back to the Bellagio for a last look. As soon as she entered the premises, she heard some conversation between employees. Damn, what I wouldn't do to be the kid right now. Tell me about it. I heard he already won around 90 mil. He's already on the 10 million buy-in table. I heard he never played Texas poker before, only five-card draw. At least that's what Jonathan said. Who's Jonathan again? He's the dealer of the kid's first table. He said what the kid's name is? Apparently, he shouted it in the poker room. I think it's Naruto Uzumaki. Natasha perked up and immediately ran to the poker room to find Naruto. When she got inside, she directly went to the high roller area. She saw a crowd forming one of the tables. Following her instinct, Natasha tried to see what's happening. When she was nearing the table, she saw through the crowd. 
The moment she saw the distinctive golden blonde hair, she knew she found Naruto. Unfortunately for her, fate had other plans. Natasha was just going to call Naruto when a man in a suit approached him. Immediately in guard, she readied herself for action. Hearing the man's offer to Naruto to join his boss for a private game of poker only made her more cautious, that is, until she finally had a good look at the man. He is happy Hogan. The personal head of security of Tony Stark himself. According to his files, he has mediocre physical combat skills, situational awareness, and high-stress decision-making, but more than makes up for it for his intelligence, intuitive leaps, and dedication to the job. He would rather die protecting Tony Stark than let him seriously get hurt. But the problem is not Happy Hogan himself, but with what his presence entails. If you can find Happy, you can find Stark somewhere close, and vice versa. The fact that Happy is already inviting Naruto to a game with his boss means that Stark is already in the building, and that means approaching Naruto is already a no-go. One of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. is Howard Stark, Tony Stark's father. He funded a large portion of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s budget and created a lot of advanced technology during his time. When he died, his friend and another founding member, Peggy Carter created an unspoken rule that S.H.I.E.L.D. would stay away out of Tony Stark's life as much as possible, but would simply protect him from the shadows. Seeing Naruto walking away with Happy Hogan, she had no other choice and dialed Fury's number. Romanoff, are you on your way to New York? Fury asked as soon as he answered. Not yet, boss. Still got time. I hit a snag on the other problem though. Natasha informed with a little apprehension. What problem? Don't tell me to didn't find him. Don't worry, boss. I found him, I just can't approach him now. What do you mean you can't approach him? He's not radioactive. He doesn't have a force field. And he's certainly not flying. So give me one good reason you can't approach him. Fury said, slowly losing his temper. Well, he's been invited in a private poker game. Natasha paused to let what she said to sink into her boss. By Tony Stark. Shit. Fury said in a word that perfectly sums up their situation. I don't know if the kid's lucky or unlucky. Fury took a deep breath and continued. We can't do anything about it now. Just go to New York. I'll assign a team to monitor the guy for now. Got it, boss. Fury hanged up the phone after that. Natasha left the building and claimed her car from the valet. She got in and drove straight to the Nevada field office, all the while thinking how hard it is to find a guy and ask a question. Chapter 12, Confirmation of Change Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada March 29, 2005, 2315H Local Who? Happy stopped and looked at Naruto incredulously. Naruto kept walking for a couple of steps until he realized his companion stopped. He looked back and saw Happy's expression. What? Naruto asked. You don't know who Tony Stark is? Happy asked to be sure. No, not really. Should I? Happy smiled brightly, hearing the answer. He finally could pull a prank and could take Tony's ego down a peg or two. Pepper would definitely, definitely love this. No, not really. Just remember that when you get in. Naruto nodded his head slowly, not really knowing what he meant. What can I expect in there? You have two CEO and two sports superstar in there. You might know the last two. Just don't let them intimidate you, and you'll be fine. Happy advised. Here we are. Just follow my lead, kid. I'm not a kid. Naruto countered with a pout. Happy just swiped his card on the electronic lock, 
and went in with Naruto following close behind. Naruto was awestruck at how fancy the room is. It's a whole lot more intricate than a lot of Daimyo's palace he has seen. Although it's a little much for his taste, he can't deny the allure of living in a place like this. He's so distracted looking around he didn't see Happy walk his way down the hall. Happy continued his way to the living room without seeing if Naruto was behind him and saw Tony and the other players still taking a break from their latest game. The two athletes are sitting on the couch while Tony and his friend are talking on the balcony. So how's the rebuild going? You guys got wrecked this season. Floyd Mayweather asked his fellow athlete Kobe Bryant. Not great, really. The front office is making some moves, but I doubt it will amount to something anytime soon. Kobe replied. Kobe looked towards the balcony. Do you think the two over there would stop talking all about that techno shit? Kobe asked, referring to Stark and Musk talking something about a new battery configuration for Musk's Tesla. I don't know. I guess we have to wait for the kid to get up here. Sometimes Tony's too spontaneous. Who would want to play a poker shark? Happy decided to interject at that moment and shouted. Guys, I found the kid. Tony looked inside when he heard Happy's voice. He walked up to him and looked behind him. So, where's the kid? Don't tell me you lost him already? Tony asked, sarcastically seeing there's no one else there. Happy looked around, searching for Naruto. Seeing this, Tony asked again. Happy. Don't tell me you really lost the kid. Tony said, losing his sarcasm. His nervousness is seeping through. He was just right behind me. Happy said while looking behind him. I'll check back at the receiving room. Happy walked back to the front door and saw Naruto still looking around the reception area. I thought I told you to follow behind me. Happy said to Naruto while giving him a hard stare. Well, sorry. I just had to look around. Naruto defended himself. Happy just sighed and said. Come on. I'll introduce you. Just stay close to me, okay? Happy and Naruto walked back to the living room and saw the guys preparing for another round of poker. Everyone looked to see who Happy brought and looked a little surprised. They saw the kid is not exactly what they thought. He's tall, around six feet two inches. He looked like he could pass as an NBA guard. Got a muscular build too. Certainly looked like an athlete. He got blonde hair and blue eyes, but his face doesn't exactly look Caucasian. Maybe Asian American. Seeing the lack of awe and adoration that usually would show on a young man's face when he meets all of them, Tony finally asked. So, who are you, kid? Naruto looked at Tony. After a few tense moments, with Tony waiting for that spark recognition, Naruto finally said. Shouldn't you be introducing yourself first? And I'm not, not a kid. Everyone in the room laughed hard. Sure Kobe's and Floyd's egos are legendary, but it had nothing on Tony Stark. He lives to see his name everywhere. Someone not knowing about him is sacrilegious. Tony just gaped at the new guest. He never thought he would meet someone who didn't know him in the USA, especially in his life lifetime. I'm Tony Stark. Billionaire, playboy, genius, philanthropist. CEO of Stark Industries. That Tony Stark. Tony introduced himself, hoping to himself that the kid would recognize him. Cool. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. The greatest Nina, I mean fighter around. Naruto introduced himself. Still not recognizing the younger Stark. Tony groaned, giving up on the prospect of the kid recognizing him. He walked back to the poker table, sat down, and sulked. 
The rest of the poker players introduced themselves. Hey. Sorry about that. He's a little vain. But don't worry, he's a good guy. The guy in a polo short defended Tony Stark. And Elon Musk. An engineer like Tony there. A tall, bald, African-American man introduced himself next. I'm Kobe Bryant. Bas basketball player. Played any basketball before? No, I can't say I have. Never even heard of it. Naruto answered in a straight face. You never heard of it. Oh, hell no. I'm going to have to teach you about it sometime. Kobe finally said. Forget about him. You do look like a fighter. You should do some boxing. I'm Floyd Mayweather, by the way. The shorter African-American guy introduced himself. Ooh. Boxing? I read about that one, but I never saw one use it before. What's it like? Naruto asked enthusiastically, finally learning something about his interest. Well, it's about using quick and strong punches to bring down the opponent, while using fast and precise footwork to dodge your opponent. Floyd explained. What about kicks, elbows, and knee strikes? Well, we don't use it. Hey. I fought someone who used that. He didn't last long. You have more experience than I thought. What's the guy's name? Maybe I heard of him. Floyd asked conversationally. Just some huge guy named Mike Lucas. Naruto said while waving his hand dismissively. Floyd immediately widened his eyes. Mike Lucas used to be a professional boxer, who started the same time as him. He's on his way to super superstar stardom, until he was caught using performance-enhancing drugs. He was banned from professional boxing ever since. Holy shit. You must be good. Where did you fight him? Everyone in the room is tuned into the conversation. They all heard of Mike the Flash Lucas. Hearing some guy fought him and won, even if not on his prime, is extraordinary. Well, there was this underground fighting tournament somewhere north of the city. Won me some serious cash. Naruto said proudly. You fought in an underground fight? Kobe asked for confirmation. Yep, lost my luggage and most my money when I got here. So I joined to win some cash. The whole thing is a little boring though. Silence dominated the room hearing their guest's story. Tony, being the impatient one, finally broke the ice. Are we going to play or not? This snapped the people in the room, and they filed toward the poker table. The table. In the room is similar to the one in the poker room, only more expensive. They sat down with Elon on the left side of the table, followed by Tony, Floyd, Kobe, then finally Naruto. Tony saw Naruto swinging backpack forward. This reminded him of what he said to Happy. You need someone to prop you up? This table has a hundred million dollar buy-in. Naruto flopped his backpack on the table and looked at Tony. No need. I got this. Naruto said with a grin and tipped over his bag. Almost a hundred pieces of chips in different dominations spilled onto the table. That should cover it. For another time during the night, they were dumbstruck. The amount he spilled on the table is closer to 200 than to 100 million. How much did you start with? Floyd asked. $250,000. Worked my way up to the N million dollar tables. Holy shit, we're fucked. Elon said, perfectly encapsulating their current position. Naruto only gave them a bigger grin and said. Well, let's play some poker. Kamar Taj, Kathmandu, Nepal. March 30th, 2005, 1200H local.
The Hidden Temple of Kamar Taj is a school created by the world's first sorcerer, Agamotto. Agamotto was a powerful man who used the mysteries of the mystic arts to defend the world against enemies the world is not prepared to face. One of the most powerful enemies he ever faced is Dormammu, an interdimensional demon hellbent on acquiring planets for his personal dimension, the Dark Dimension. There was no chance for Agamotto to win against the demon if not for a powerful item, he forged using one of the most powerful objects in the universe. He named it the Eye of Agamotto. It's capable of bending time to the will of the user. He used it to push back Dormammu to the Dark Dimension. To prevent Dormammu of ever conquering the planet, he created the Three Sanctums as mystical shields against extra-dimensional beings to protect the world against mystical attacks from other dimensions, and alongside it, the Temple of Kamar Taj, tasked with training sorcerers. These sorcerers are soldiers trained in harnessing the mystical energies from other dimensions, and use it to protect the world. Agamotto named himself as the Sorcerer Supreme, and helped create a new generation of sorcerers. Before he died, he named another the title of Sorcerer Supreme to one of his students, and passed down with it the Eye of Agamotto. This has continued for thousands of years until an unprecedented event happened. A Sorcerer Supreme saw a different future. The next adequate Sorcerer Supreme after her is not to be born for almost a thousand years in the future. Seeing no alternate solution, she harnessed the dark energy from the dark dimension to extend her lifespan. She had lived for so long that everyone called her the Ancient One. She had guided dozens of generations of new sorcerers, preparing them for what's to come. The Ancient One knew her time is coming, and she had already accepted it. Nevertheless, she religiously looks into the future using the Eye of Agamotto. She was prepared to see the same future, confirming what she already knew. What she didn't expect is the sudden change in the visions of the future mid-session. She can't clearly see who or what caused the change, only its effects. The only glimpse she found is a yellow fox. It's like an invincible mountain was dropped on top of the river of time, effectively changing critical events in the future, one of those events, her death. She can finally see the events of what is to come after her death, and for the first time in a very long time, she felt fear. She saw the end of over half of the life in the universe. The Ancient One snapped out of her meditation and took a deep breath. She took her time to choose her next path. Either she does nothing and let destiny take its course, or she does something now and change what is to come for better or for worse. Finally deciding on her choice, she walked calmly out of her room and faced her attendant for the day and said, Call everyone available to the central grounds in an hour. I'll inform everyone of some of the changes that would happen. And bring Miki Silas, Mordo, and Pangborn. The attendant looked stunned for a moment. The Ancient One never called such a large meeting. Only meetings with individuals, or at most small groups. He stood there for some time until snapping out of it, when he saw the Ancient One walking back to her room. The attendant ran through the corridor, remembering the Ancient One's orders. Back in her room, the Ancient One was contemplating the decision she had made. Seeing that she would not be able to reverse Destiny's path to what it was before, she comforted herself with her decision. Change has come. The Ancient One could be heard saying this in her empty room. Chapter 13 What the Hell Happened Point 1 Bellagio Hotel Casino Las Vegas, Nevada. March 30th, 2005, 1000 H local. Tony was sleeping peacefully until he was woken up by the most beautiful voice he ever heard. Wake the hell up, Tony. I swear to God. Shaking up the cobwebs in his head, Tony opened his eyes and saw something he never expected to be his angel. Don't make me throw this bucket of water at you. Ugh. Tony tried to get up, but his pounding headache begged to differ. Okay, you asked for it. Tony felt water splash his face, and he immediately shot up. What the hell? 
Tony looked around to see what's happening, and where is he? He looked like he was in his hotel room. The weirdest thing was the only other person in the room is his personal assistant, Virginia Pepper Potts. Pepper used to work for another scientist entrepreneur, until she finally had enough of the flirting of her boss and left. Stark Industries later hired her as an accountant for their finance department. Her diligence and detailed work in the department caused her to find some discrepancies in an account. After her immediate superior ignored her findings, she marched her way towards the office of Tony Stark to report what she saw. Pepper caused a scene at Tony's office when she wasn't allowed to meet him. In a natural reaction of Tony Stark's personal bodyguards, they pepper sprayed her. When Tony Stark got out of his office and saw the aftermath of the commotion, he laughed hard. This event would leave such a great impression on the CEO that he pulled her out of the finance department and made her his personal assistant, and more importantly, Tony gave her the nickname Pepper. Pepper continued to grow and develop being under Tony Stark's personal employ. This is not because Tony taught or guided her, no, this was because Tony basically put her through a trial by fire. Whether you love him or hate him, Tony Stark is an undeniable genius who appears once in a century. This genius caused Stark Industries to grow from a technological research company to a multinational conglomerate focusing on weapon manufacture. Tony's corporate ability enabled him to make the company flourished, but he was never enthusiastic about running a company. He only wanted to tinker and invent new stuff. This trait caused Tony Stark to place Pepper Potts in a position that would allow her to do basically everything Tony was supposed to do. Pepper's sudden predicament forced her to learn the ins and outs of the company. She expanded her studies while working for Stark until she got multiple masters and doctorates from Harvard and Yale, all related to business administration and management. Currently, she had more than enough credentials and skills to run any Fortune 500 company. Everyone else in the industry tried to hire or poached her away, but some part of her was always telling her not to leave her boss. Through the years, she and Tony have developed a good working relationship and an even better personal relationship. Pepper had somehow applied order to Tony's chaotic lifestyle. The only part of the job she now minds is she had to take care of Tony's one nightstand. But that's not why Pepper is so angry this morning. Why did I have to find out on the news that you and another guy took down an Italian mob while drunk? Pepper shouted. What? Ow, not too loud. A hangover Tony asked. I don't know. All I know is what the news is telling. The Las Vegas Metro PD and the FBI are trying to get hold of you trying to make sense of a situation. Your lawyers are trying to contact you too. What the hell happened, Tony? This is one of the worst th things you've ever done. Tony was seriously worried about what happened, he tried to recall what happened last night. He tried to remember what happened last night. Tony remembered that he, Elon, Kobe, Floyd, and his invite, Naruto was playing poker with Happy as the dealer. Naruto was destroying them until one by one they folded out except for himself. Flashback start. I'm tapping out while I still can. You're seriously like the pool shark of poker. Elon said while collecting his chips. I'm going back to my room. You should fold out to while you still can. Elon finished, referring to the small stack of chips on Tony's table. He barely got $3 million left, while all the others pulled out, when they reach around $50 million left. They saw that it was pointless, and they would only lose money to Naruto. Tony's only answer is a nod with a grunt. He is already a little bit wasted, indicated by the half-finished bottle of bourbon by his side. Happy is at the dealer side of the table, absolutely enjoying the poker beatdown the kid was giving his boss. Elon said goodbye to both Naruto and Happy. He took one last drink and left. Tony looked back to see Elon go out of the room, thinking about folding out of the game right now. 
Only Stark's ego and overwhelming alcohol are pushing him to keep playing. He looked back at Naruto and asked. Next round? Naruto looked at Tony a little bit weirdly. He knew that Tony took the most hit during the game because of his aggressive game style. The chips he had left could only cover the small blind, but he has to cover the big blind for the upcoming round. Are you sure? Naruto finally asked. Cause I'm okay with covering the big blind again. You'll just have to go all in as your opening bet. Tony rechecked his chips and saw that Naruto was right. He thinks over a solution for a moment until he finally spoke. I'll give you an open favor for one last game. All or nothing. What good is your favor? I got almost $350 million here with me. Why the hell should I say yes? Naruto said, baiting the CEO for more. Tony act offended at Naruto's statement. I'm Tony Stark. One of the richest and smartest men alive. I could literally put you on the moon, and here I am, basically giving you a blank check. Tony said exaggeratedly. As long as Pepper is not entirely opposed to it. Tony finished with a little fear in his eyes. Pepper would skin him alive if he gave another person one of those open favors without running it by Pepper first. Happy laughed hard when he heard the last statement. Who's Pepper? Naruto asked the laughing bodyguard. She's Tony's personal assistant and nanny. Happy said the last part as a joke. Naruto giggled a little bit at that, understanding the jab on Tony's personality. Naruto looked at Tony and said, Make that five, and you have a deal. Three. Tony countered while extending his hand. Naruto was going to shake Tony's hand, but before he reached it he said, Three and a room in your LA residence, and you're going to teach me engineering and computer stuff. Happy gave Naruto a weird look, but Naruto only shrugged. I just moved to the US, lost most of my stuff, and I have nowhere to go. This would solve that problem and learn something new. Naruto defended himself. Don't worry though, I'll be traveling for a while. Naruto then looked at Happy and said, you can even check my background if you like. Tony agonized it for over a second. He likes his solitary lifestyle, and adding this unknown guess might shatter that. On the other hand, the kid would like to learn something from him, and his ego like that. That was the tipping point. Deal. The two of them shook hands. The result was as expected, Naruto won without much difficulty. This caused Naruto's finance to grow to $410,489,374. He also got a temporary home base and three blank checks on one of the most influential men alive. Ugh, you really have the luck of the devil. Tony said while pouring himself another drink, looking at Naruto, packing the chips in his bag, almost making it burst at the seams. Leave it there. I'll just have the manager in cash it tomorrow. I'll even cover the fee. I own this place anyway. Really? Naruto asked. Seeing Tony nod, he just left it on the table. He then stood up, fixed up his jacket, and looked at Tony. Well, I'm leaving. When and where are we going to meet tomorrow? Naruto asked. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up there, sunshine. You just made me lose a whole lot of cash, a room, and a lot of my time in the future. At the very least, you're going to have a drink with me. Tony said, stopping Naruto in his tracks. But I don't drink, and I have to find a place to stay. Naruto countered. Nope. We're going to have a drink and talk like men. Tony said, urging Naruto to accept. When he saw Naruto sat down again, resigning to his fate. Fate. Tony looked at Happy and said, take the night off, Happy. 
You look like shit. Happy thought for a second before nodding and going to one of the spare rooms. What's your poison? Tony asked. I don't know. I only ever tried sake with my grandma. Naruto said. Damn, your grandma's hardcore. Tony poured two glasses of bourbon and handed one to Naruto. You should try that one. Naruto took it and stared cautiously at the amber-colored drink. He took a small sip at it to taste it. Hmm. Not bad. Naruto looked contemplative for a second before saying. Yep, she really was. I can't believe I only met her when I was 13. Why's that? I only met her when my godfather, which is also my grandfather figure, tried to find her. She was something of a traveler and a medic. The thing is, she only stayed in bars and casinos even though she can never really win at gambling. Damn, and you basically win every time you play. Some weird family you got. Yup. So what about you, what's your story? Tony swirled his bourbon before taking a swig. You really don't know, do you? He saw Naruto shook his head no and continued, well, basically, it's the same as other wealthy family stories. Parents don't have time for their kids. They died on a business trip when I was around your age. How old are you actually? 21. Birthday in October. Naruto said. You're lucky. You never said they didn't love you. What I would give to get a chance like that. Did they beat you or something? Tony asked a little cautiously. He's aware that there are a lot of people who have it worse than him. No. As far as I know. They loved me a lot. I just never had the chance to meet them personally. They died on the day I was born. Some huge calamity happened on my birthday. Took the lives of a lot of people in my hometown, including my parents. I only got to know their names when I was 17. Naruto said with a sad chuckle. There was a lull in the conversation, with both of them trying to cheer themselves up from the conversation. Got a girl in your life? Tony asked, trying to continue the conversation and stir it away from the heavy talk. You really think I would move to the US alone if I had a girl? Naruto said with a raised eyebrow. Well, I don't know. That's why I asked. Tony defended himself. How about you, you got someone? Naruto returned the question. No, no, not really. Only one night stands. Oh. How about that, Pepper? Pepper? Where'd you get that? We're great friends, I guess. But we don't have any romantic inclinations. Why not? Naruto asked. That simple question echoed continuously inside his head, getting louder and louder. Looking back, Tony would always say that particular question by Naruto changed his life. Naruto saw the blank stare on Tony's face. Being respectful, he allowed Tony to think over whatever he was thinking about. After a few more minutes, Naruto finally had enough and shook Tony to get his attention. So, what are you thinking about? Naruto asked with a sly smile. Nothing. Tony said a little too fast. So, what do you want to do now? Tony asked, trying to get the topic moving. Naruto taught for a second before removing a small calling card from his jacket pocket and showed it to Tony. You said you own this place, right? I had one of your attendants gave this to me saying that if I have any problems, just call the number on this and look for Ricardo Falcone. Want to look into it? Naruto immediately knew that the attendant is up to no good since he already saw a lot of those scams when he was with Tsunade. It also helped that Kurama said that the guy reeks of negative emotions. Being a little thrill-seeker himself and intoxicated, 
Tony only saw the good side of this endeavor. Oh hell yeah. Let's go to security. Flashback to be continued. Chapter 14, What the Hell Happened Point 2 Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada March 30, 2005, 10.30 h local Tony, talk to me. Don't think you can get out of this mess. Pepper said while pacing back and forth in front of the dazed Tony. Having enough, she snapped at him. Tony. Tony shook his head, snapping out of his daze and said, I never noticed how beautiful your hair is. Tony and Pepper both froze when the words left his mouth. He has no idea why he said it. Well, he has some idea, but now is not the time to linger on it. Did I just say that out loud? Tony asked with no one in particular, but Pepper nodded anyway. When Tony got his answer, he took a deep breath and said, Damn. Naruto seriously did a number on me. Anyways, where was I? You went down to security. Pepper said helpfully. And we're going to talk about what that Naruto said to you later. Can we not? Tony asked, hoping not to go through the mushy stuff that they would be definitely trudging through when that conversation continues. Pepper only gave him a hard glare. Tony deflated, knowing he already lost. Trying to retake hold of the conversation, he finally continued trying to remember what happened. Flashback continues. Oh hell yeah. Let's go to security. Tony shouted while putting on his blazer. Why? Naruto asked. Well, do you know who gave this to you? Tony said while waving around the calling card. Naruto shook his head no. That's why we're going there first. We need to find out who gave this to you and who's this Falcon guy. Oh. Okay. What are we waiting for? Come on. Naruto said, vibrating with excitement. Okay, okay, sheesh. Let me get my stuff first. Tony took his IDs and walked out the door. Naruto followed behind Tony with a hop in his step while Tony is trying to act sober. He led them straight to the office of the head of security. When they reached the office, Tony went right through the door without missing a step. Joey. How you doing? Tony asked the guy who was sitting on the opposite side of the desk. He didn't even notice the guy reaching for his gun. Joey Griffin is an unassuming 55-year-old, 5 feet 10 inches man with Irish descent. He has reddish-brown hair and green eyes. Joey was a Navy SEAL squad captain until he took a bullet to the knee ending his field career. He was going to continue to serve the military as an instructor to help mold the next generation of SEALs, but the news of his daughter's cancer meant that he has to find a more profitable job. This led him straight to being hired by Stark Industries to be head of security for its subsidiary, MGM Hotels and Casinos. He's been assigned as head of security for all MGM buildings in Las Vegas. His increased pay and premium insurance had allowed his daughter to receive the best treatment possible. The, the reason he was still in his office was that there are multiple VIPs currently in the building, especially his boss's boss, Tony Stark. Seeing Tony Stark burst through his door at this time of night was the last thing he thought would happen. He calmed himself down and tried to stand up. But before he could stand up to shake his boss's hand, he felt a knife on his throat. Holy fuck. Naruto. When did you get there? Get that knife away from him. He's the one we're going to meet. Tony said to Naruto, finally noticing him standing behind one of his security officers. And can you teach me? added Tony a little hesitantly. Naruto withdrew his knife away from the guy's neck and pocketed his knife. He walked back to the door while still keeping an eye on Joey. Joey, on the other hand, was scared for his life. 
He only felt this kind of fear when Saddam Hussein's private guard captured him, and now there's this guy, whoever the hell he is. He never even saw the guy pass through the door. Joey rubbed his neck and looked at Tony. Mr. Stark, not that I'm not happy to see you, but why are you here, and who's the guy who almost opened up my neck? Joey asked, still alert from the previous encounter. Hey, good to see you're still alive. Tony said with an awkward laugh. And this guy here is Naruto. He's kind of the reason why we're here. Joey narrowed his eyes to the blonde guy next to his boss. All the bells in his head are warning him that the guy is dangerous. You want me to call the police on him? Joey asked, completely serious. No, not really. He's the guy who'd been ripping off the people in the poker room. Tony informed Joey. Ah. I knew he looked familiar. Joey said, still not relaxing. And he's going to apologize for what he did, Tony said while looking straight at Naruto. Hey. He's the one who tried to draw a weapon. It's not my fault he's slow. Naruto defended himself. Ever since the war, war, he's wary of hidden weapons. It's better safe than sorry when it came to those. Joey tried to defend himself, but he knew he would do the same in that kind of situation. Naruto's answer just earned a look from Tony until he finally caved. Sorry. Naruto apologized while scratching the back of his head. Joey waited for something more, but he never got a continuation of that apology. After a few more seconds, he sighed and nodded. He then looked back at Tony and asked, By the way, why are you here, boss? Two things. I want you to look for the attendant who greeted Naruto when he walked into the Bellagio, and what can you tell me about Ricardo Falcone? Tony answered while handing over the calling card to Joey. I'll look through the footage. Joey said while scrolling through his computer. He then looked at Naruto and asked, What time did you get in? Maybe around 7.30. Naruto answered. Okay. Joey opened his desk drawer and retrieved a folder. He slid it toward Tony's direction. In the meantime, that's the file I have on Falcone and the Bianchi crime family. Does Falcone have a man on the inside? According to this guy, yes. Tony said while patting Naruto while looking through the file. He told me the attendant gave him that card and said to call Ricardo Falcone. Damn, thought I got rid of them all. They just grow like weeds. Joey said while still scrolling with the CCTV footage. Got it, it's Morris Grant. He's got almost five years with us. He said and looked at Tony, who placed the folder on the desk. I'll take care of it, sir. Have a nice night. Okay, have nice night too, Joey. Tony said and left. Sorry again about the thing earlier. Naruto apologized again before following Tony. When they reached the elevator, Naruto asked. What now? Well, I saw three main locations for the Bianchi crime family. We can hit them all tonight. Tony said with a smile. Wait up. You're not coming with me. Do you even know how to fight? Or use one of those guns? Do you even have one of those? Naruto said while thinking about the mess bringing a civilian in a fight. Hey. Of course, I know how. I'm the CEO of a weapons manufacturing conglomerate. I designed and built more than half of what we sold. Tony said proudly. Do you even know where you are going? He asked, knowing the answer. Naruto hanged his head low for that minor oversight. The elevator door opened, showing the parking garage. Tony walked to a closed gate and placed his palm on a console. The whole gate lifted, revealing two cars, a black Hummer 5 and a hot rod red Ferrari Enzo. 
Tony walked over to the Hummer's driver's side door and got in. Naruto followed and got in the passenger side door. Tony started the car using the key from the visor. He then opened the glove and central compartment, revealing an FN F2000 and a Beretta 92 FS, each with multiple magazines. Tony looked at Naruto smug and said, Yes, I have some of those guns. All right. I'm going to take point. You trail behind. Try not to use that on anyone. We don't want them dead. We wanted them captured by the police. Got that? Naruto laid out the plan. He could use shadow clones, but where's the fun in that? Why do you got to go first? I'm the one with the gun. Tony countered. You got almost no experience based on your reaction to Joey. You're a civilian. You're drunk. Take your pick. Naruto listed. Besides, I don't need a gun. I'm a close and personal kind of guy. By the way, can I have those shades? Naruto said the last part pointing to the Ray-Ban Aviator Classic shades on the dashboard. Sure, go ahead. Don't see the reason why you would need those when it's dark out. Tony pointed out the obvious ignoring the rest of the Naruto's statement, but following his plan nonetheless. Naruto knew that wearing shades in the dark is stupid since it leaves you almost blind, but he's not going to use it to keep out the light. He'll use it to cover the change he's I would go through when he activates his dojitsu, Rina Tensei Sharingan. Or simply Shinigan, because the full name is such a mouthful, and the death god is such a massive part of his life. His own dojitsu is the result of the equal parts mixing of Senju and Uchiha blood, forming the Rina Sharingan. The Tensigen, the final form of the Byakugan, much like the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan, is to the Sharingan, was a byproduct of Kagaya Atsutsuki's blood mixing with his own. The process almost killed him, but he survived due to his Uzumaki vitality and Kurama's Yuki. The Shinigen combines all the best parts of the three dojitsus, making it the ultimate dojitsu. It allows him to see chakra networks and tenketsus, 3D X-ray vision up to 10 kilometers away, eidetic memory, telescopic vision, and a whole lot more. Tony stopped the car next to an apartment complex. He took both of the guns and two spare magazines before he looked at Naruto. Seeing that Tony is gearing up, Naruto slipped on the shades and activated his eyes. He can see eight guys with weapons and an unarmed guy sleeping all on the top floor. You remember the plan? Naruto asked to confirm. Yep. I'm going to follow far behind you and try not to shoot anyone. Tony said. Naruto got off the car with Tony following behind him. Chapter 15 what the hell happened? Point three. Bellagio Hotel Casino, Las Vegas, Nevada. March 30th, 2005, 1045H local. You went in there with him. Pepper shouted angrily. She started pacing back and forth again. And you're the one who wanted to go with. What if you've been hurt or worse, killed? Well, I'm not that hurt, am I? Tony said while checking his body for any injuries. He only saw a small gash by his temple. Besides, you should have seen Naruto. The guy is a force of nature. He took out everyone without a gun. Tony took on a contemplative face. Maybe I should hire him as a bodyguard. He can take on an army. What? No. You and that guy got in more trouble together than should be possible. My hair is turning white just thinking about what would happen. Pepper immediately denied the idea. Tony just laughed nervously. Pepper immediately had a bad feeling. She stopped pacing and stared. What did you do? Pepper asked dangerously. You remember the final bet? Tony asked, his nervousness showing. Yes. 
Pepper drawled out. Well, it's not only the three favors that I gave. I also would give him a room on L.A. and give him engineering and computer lessons. Tony said, waiting for the inevitable blow-up. What? Pepper reacted. She sat down next to Tony and took a deep breath. Just, just continue with what happened. Pepper said, giving up on the prospect of a dark future ahead of her. Uh, sure. Tony said, hoping not to agitate Pepper more. Flashback continue. Ricardo Falcone is a high-positioned member of the Bianchi crime family. Although not related to the Bianchis, his father was one of the first outsiders who joined the crime family. His father's resourcefulness and loyalty allowed him to rise quickly through the ranks. He inherited the Lone Shark gig from his father and allowed it to grow to a profitable venture for the family. Ricardo, Ricardo would always be loyal to the Bianchis, that's why he ordered his men not to join any faction between Vinny and Giovanni. He would usually join Vinny's camp since what Giovanni did goes against everything of what a family stands for, but the family needs to survive the aftermath. Whatever happens between the brothers, the family would need capital to recover, and bringing everyone in for the confrontation would just fracture the family and increase the damage that would happen. That's his reason and what he told the two when they called for his support. They really can't question his loyalty since he's been loyal from the start. He slept in one of the family's bases to make sure that if someone retaliated for him not joining any sides, he would be as far away from his family as possible. The eight-man guard is just extra precaution. He would be proven right to have them, but it wouldn't do a thing for what's to come. At least it's not one hostile Bianchi brother that came for him. Ricardo is looking at the clock, waiting for it to strike two. That's when the Bianchi brothers would meet, and the fate of the family would be decided. He was lounging on the sofa with his men when someone knocked on the door. Everyone immediately tensed up and drew their weapons. The situation they are in had everyone on edge. The knocking continued until one of the guys closer to the door peeked through the eye hole. He saw a blonde guy with shades wearing a hoodie. He's relatively young too. The guard walked over to Ricardo and said, There's some blonde guy on the other side of the door. Early twenties, I reckon. Check what he wants. Just be prepared for anything. Ricardo advised. The guard nodded and walked back to the door. He unlocked the door except for the door chain and opened it. What do you want? He said, trying to be more intimidating. Hi. Naruto said in an overly cheery voice. I'm looking for a Ricardo Falcone. The guard drew his pistol and pointed it at the guy behind the door, ready to kill him if he did anything wrong. There's no one here by that name. Leave. The guard closed the door while still pointing his gun at it. He walked towards his boss and said, He's looking for you. I sent him away. Good. We don't want any distractions tonight. Ricardo said. As soon as everyone sat down, they heard another knock on the door. The guard jogged to the door annoyed and ready to turn the guy away again. When he was trying to reach for the door, it suddenly burst open. Naruto saw the guy running to the door with his shinigan. This was the perfect moment to attack. They would be unprepared, thinking that the same guy is just looking for their boss again. He kicked the door open and immediately disabled the guard with precise and accurate attacks on the guard's tinketsis. He saw everyone frozen in their spot. He ran towards the center of the room. He lowered himself and extended both of his hands and said, You're within the range of my divination. 8 trigrams 64 palms. He hit each person left mobile in the room, including Ricardo Falcone, eight times, effectively temporarily paralyzing everyone. He dragged everyone and lined them up on the wall. You can come in now. 
Naruto said towards the hallway. Tony saw almost everything that happened by peeking by the end of the hallway near the staircase. He was pretty sure his gun wouldn't do a thing even at this distance. What he can't figure out is how did Naruto paralyze everyone with only a few pokes here and there. Tony walked towards the apartment and saw Naruto looking over a guy in a gray three-piece suit. That's Ricardo Falcone. Holy shit, that's a big catch. Tony said with a little bit of shock. He didn't expect some of the big guys to be here. Yup. Can you check the cabinet for files, or anything incriminating? Take a picture of everything if you can. Call the cops too before we leave. Tony nodded to Naruto's request, but not before mumbling about something about him not being his sidekick. Tony began checking through the drawers and cabinets. He laid out every document he could find and laid it out on the table, and took photos of everything. While Tony was doing that, Naruto was opening up some tenketsus on Falcon, so he can be mobile enough to ask some questions. Where's your boss? Naruto asked so he can take down the crime family straight from the top quickly. Falcon just kept his mouth shut, knowing that someone like this guy going after Vinny during his showdown might as well cause the family collapse. Seeing that Falcon wouldn't talk without some extreme measures, which he can't use since apparently torture is frowned upon in this world. He applied a small jinjutsu on him to make him more cooperative. Due to the atrophied chakra network of the residents of this world, Falcon can't even put up a fight against the jinjutsu. I'm going to ask again, where's your boss? He's at the abandoned warehouse north of the city, where the underground fights usually happen. Falcon said, not adding the part about the Bianchi brothers' showdown, since he wasn't explicitly asked about it. Naruto knocked out Falcon and went over to get Tony. You done here? Naruto asked. Yep, just about. Can't believe the dirt on these guys, and it's only one side of their business. Tony said while fixing up the file on the table. Tony then jogged out of the door, followed by Naruto, but not before taking a photo of the guards and Falcon. He texted a contact he has from the FBI about what they found out. He's pretty high up the ladder to make sure the Bianchi can't bury the case. When they got in the car, Naruto said. We should go to the warehouse district. Do you know the address of their base there? If not, I can guide you. Yeah, one of their bases is around there. Tony started the car and drove north. You know, what we did back there was kind of fun even though I didn't do much. What are you saying? You did most of the work. Work. I just beat those guys down. Naruto reassured. When they were nearing the warehouse, Naruto told Tony to pull over. Why do you want me to stop here? We're still two blocks away. Tony argued. We might encounter guards outside since their boss is there. It's easier to sneak in on foot than this huge car. Naruto said, already knowing that there are guards posted outside with two factions meeting on the inside of the warehouse. He formed a plan quickly in his head that would make them do the least amount of work. Tony almost banged his head on the steering wheel for not thinking about it. The two immediately dismounted the car and walked towards the warehouse. They're sticking in the shadows with Naruto still on point. When they were a building away from the warehouse, Naruto pointed an alleyway for them to enter. Here's the plan. I want you to find a way to get on top of the warehouse and go down to the catwalk. I'm going to cause a distraction. When you see it, fire your weapon. After that, hang tight and enjoy the show. Naruto said with a grin. Tony had no idea why Naruto would plan something like that, but seeing Naruto operate, he just decided to trust Naruto with this. But still, he has a question. What's the distraction? Tony asked. You'll know it when you see it. Naruto said. 
Tony just nodded to the vague answer. The two separated with Naruto running towards a shadow and somehow disappearing in it. In his slightly intoxicated state, he just dismissed the event. Tony lurked around the warehouse, looking for a way up, making sure he was sticking to the shadows. He finally saw a fire escape. Tony climbed up the ladder. He looked around to look for any guards. Seeing none, he proceeded to go to the skylight and drop down it to the catwalk. Naruto's plan finally made sense when he saw the scene inside the warehouse. He didn't even question how he knew. There looks like two groups with the two older guys leading the groups. They looked like to be talking calmly, but an undercurrent of tension can be seen on everyone. While he was looking over the developing situation, he finally understood what the distraction was. Thick white smoke was rolling in from every crevice. He had no idea how Naruto did it, but it was goddamned effective. Tony aimed at the back of one group and fired. All hell broke loose. Both factions were already tense before the smokescreen, but the tension skyrocketed after it. The sound of gunfire immediately prompted both sides to fire in the general direction of their enemy. Gunfire was raining from both sides, hitting enemies and allies alike due to the smoke. The only one unharmed were the two older guys who have been protected and pulled away pretty fast. The fighting was just about to die down when a bullet flew past Tony, causing him panic and backpedaled. He tripped backward and hit his head on the guide bars of the catwalk. This immediately knocked him out. Naruto saw this happen even though he's quite the distance away watching the situation unfold. He always kept an eye on Tony to make sure he's safe. He knew the bullet wouldn't Tony, but he should have accounted for the instinctual reactions of civilians. He immediately shunshined to Tony's location and checked on his vitals. Naruto finally took a relaxing breath when he determined that Tony was just knocked out cold. Losing his patience for the fighting to stop entirely, Naruto threw another smoke bomb, covering further the whole warehouse with smoke. He jumped down and used his shinigan to determine all the conscious or abled bodies left inside the warehouse. warehouse. Naruto determined that there are 15 people left able to fight back, excluding the two leaders. They're both hiding behind some crates on the far side of the room. He rapidly struck down all the fighters with a little less finesse than he used on Falcone's men. He has some little leeway on the damage since both sides are already shooting at each other. Naruto used a combination of intercepting fist and gentle fist fighting style. He struck down everyone he came up against while hiding himself in the smoke. The high-speed bullets certainly made the fight a little more enjoyable. When every one of the guards is down or dead, Naruto attacked temporarily paralyzed both of the leaders and dragged them to the middle of the room. Naruto was going to start asking questions when he heard the sirens indicating the cops are nearby. They must have responded to the gunshot reports from the area. He gave up on trying to get more information and just decided to bug out. He picked up Tony and sealed his guns. He shunshined towards the car and sealed it too after making sure that no one is around. Naruto only used Shunshin all the way to the hotel, since he hadn't left a Horatian tag in there. When he reached the underground parking of the Bellagio, he unsealed the car in the garage and shunshined towards Tony's penthouse. He looked for Tony's room. When he found it, he left Tony on the bed and walked away, making sure the door is closed behind him. Naruto walked towards the penthouse door and said to himself, What a night. I think I earned myself a little ramen. Before going out and finding somewhere who serve ramen in this city at this time. Flashback end. That's all I remember. Tony finished his story. Where's Naruto anyway? He asked while looking around the penthouse with Pepper following him. I don't know. I didn't saw anyone when I came here two hours ago. Pepper said. Happy's missing too. 
Tony stated his observation. He's with Joey and the feds giving their statements. Don't worry, there's a lawyer with them. Pepper reassured. She's one of the people who's managing the damage control for Tony and this Naruto's mess. Just let them tell the truth. That two guys took down a criminal empire in Vegas that everyone else can't. Tony said, with a proud smile. Pepper just took a deep calming breath and said, Just call your lawyers and work it out with them before giving a statement. I'm going to try to find your friend. Tony poured himself a cup coffee and looked behind her. No need, he's right behind you. Tony said with a grin. Pepper immediately turned around and saw a blonde-haired guy with blue eyes wearing a hoodie. He was eating a cup of instant noodles using chopsticks. What infuriated her more than she already is was the carefree look he has. You. Pepper shouted while pointing at Naruto. Me? Naruto asked dumbly, not following the conversation. Yes, you. What do you have to say for yourself? Dragging around my boss across town to bring down the mob. Naruto's expression took on something like he finally understood something. He took on a cheerful smile. It was Tony's turn to feel the chill running down his spine, seeing the smile in Naruto's face. Oh. You must be Pepper. Naruto said while extending his hand. Pepper just shook Naruto's hand, getting swept by his friendly demeanor. Did Tony finally ask you for a date? That's why you're here, right? Tony spat his coffee, hearing Naruto's question. Chapter 16 Warmer, Warmer, Warmer New York City, New York March 30th, 2005, 0800H Local Natasha had just landed on the roof of the Shield New York field office using a Quinjet. She had barely slept along the way. The stress of the manhunt of a possible alien and the accidental discovery of a superhuman in Vegas weighs heavily in her mind. When she got off the Quinjet, she was expecting Barton or Coulson to meet her on the helipad. What she was not expecting is Nick Fury standing with both of them. Didn't expect to see you here, sir. Natasha greeted her boss while giving a small nod to Barton and Coulson. Let's get inside. I'll talk along the way. Fury said and walked toward the roof entrance. I was not expecting to be here too, but I got an interesting call two hours ago. Fury looked back to see if he got everyone's attention, especially Romanoff. But first, I want you to tell them about what you found first while you're on your brief vacation. Natasha immediately knew that the call must be related to Naruto. What the hell could he have done that would warrant a call to Fury himself in the span of a five-hour flight? Seeing the attention of her colleagues was on her, she spoke. I was on my way to Vegas to take my break after the mission in L.A. when I met a guy on walking by the side of the I-15. What? You picked up someone? Didn't know you got it in you. Barton teased. He just couldn't resist teasing Natasha every opportunity he gets. Fury, already used to the two, just let the interruption pass. Shut up, Clint, or I'm going to tell Laura about Tbilisi. Seeing Barton effectively cowed, Natasha continued, anyway, the guy had nothing on him except his clothes. According to him, he just moved to the U.S. and traveling around. He said he lost all his stuff and going to Vegas to get some money to continue his travel, which in my opinion is crazy. But what got my attention and caused me to call boss is that he said that he was a freelance contractor. So your first hitchhiker is a contract killer. Good to know Romanoff. Coulson said with a smile. He already deduced that the situation is not as bad as it seems since Fury is not giving the report. You shut up too. I can still key Lola. Coulson's smile fell off his face too. When we left our separate ways, I was still thinking about what he said, 
so I started digging. Nothing came up in all available databases. Damn, he must be good. Barton said with a whistle. So I got a little desperate and made contact with the Bianchis. Her two colleagues were about to reprimand her for doing something reckless, but she already anticipated it and placed her hands over their mouths before continuing. I made sure I have leverage before I got in. But either way, I certainly got more than I thought. They arrived in a briefing room. To emphasize her point, she projected the fight on the wall to show them. As you can see, I was proven right to be wary of him. Hmm. He's good. Coulson said in a clipped tone. This part you won't like, Coulson. Natasha warned him. Shield Tech analyzed the video. The results showed that he is better, at least physically, than Captain. Captain who? Coulson asked, not getting the statement. Natasha pointed to a flag outside the room. His face immediately paled. Someone managed to remake the serum? He asked with a shake in his voice. Captain America has always been his hero. Learning that someone, somewhere, had somehow recreated the serum is massive news for him. No, not that we are aware of, but we're not completely sure. Natasha answered. I was going to make contact with him in the Bellagio since he was playing poker, but Tony Stark got to him first. How? Barton exclaimed. He's apparently excellent at poker and Stark heard about it. He invited him to his private game. Natasha answered. Thank you for the report, Romanoff. Fury interjected. Reports have come in that all the high-level and most of the low-level members of the Bianchi crime family has been arrested. Don't tell me it's Naruto? Natasha asked. Who's Naruto? Another ghost? Coulson asked, remembering a S.H.I.E.L.D. special op agent codenamed Ghost due to her ability to phase through solid objects and partial capability to be invisible. No, Naruto is the guy I found in Vegas. Natasha clarified. Your boyfriend did that. He's hardcore. Barton said. He's not my boyfriend. Where the hell in my report did you get that? Natasha denied vehemently. Ahem. Fury cleared his throat to get everyone's attention. As much as I like to get into Romanoff's romantic life. Natasha gave him the stink eye with that statement. We have to get back to the topic at hand. Yes, Naruto was one of the people responsible for Bianchi family downfall. One of them? Coulson picked up on Fury's choice of words. Yes. He apparently thought it was a fun idea to bring a civilian. Fury took on a more serious expression. He took with him a drunk Tony Stark. Coulson and Barton had a wide-eyed expression before laughing hysterically. Both of them thinking of what they wouldn't give to see that guy tow a drunk Stark around while taking down a crime family. That's got to be an event for the ages. Natasha, Natasha, on the other hand, is banging her head on the table repeatedly. How the hell can so much happen within two days of her meeting him? She currently wishes that she hadn't taken that vacation to Vegas. Maybe then she would have one less problem to deal with. I sent additional teams to monitor the situation. If Stark's army of lawyers can't deal with the situation, I'll make some moves. Fury said while outlining his plan. For the other reason, I'm here. He turned to Coulson before continuing. I want everything you got about the 083. I have a meeting with POTUS and JCS. They want an update on the event. They're also going to show me something that could be related to the 083. Apparently, it's for eyes only. Finishing his statement, Fury started to walk out of the room. But before he could leave entirely, he looked back and said to Romanoff, Before I forget, Naruto Uzumaki has suddenly appeared in our databases. You might want to look into that after this. 
He then walked out. Natasha groaned again, hearing the news. Why can't everything be so simple? Naruto probably found a high-class forger in Vegas. Average forging jobs would not show in their databases since no paper trail would be made. Bianchi probably knew who is the best forger in Vegas, but it probably has to wait. The mission right now has the most precedent. Natasha faced Carlson and Barton and asked. Want to catch me up on what's happening here? I'll go first since my side has the least progress. Barton said to both of them. The search for the alien, or the reason for the spotlight. Spotlight? Natasha asked for clarification. Well, 083 is just dull. So we call it the spotlight. Barton answered. No lead panned out. If there's an alien that crossed using the spotlight, there's no sign for it any anywhere. The cause of the spotlight is now assumed caused by the alien, so we can't move forward without finding it. Barton finished his report before looking at Coulson to report his side. The techs found no trace evidence at the site. The only clue we have is the eight cherry blossoms trees that grew exactly 100 m away from the site and positioned at the eight directions of the compass. The trees are virtually indestructible, only the bark and leaf samples are taken. The genetic test identified the tree as Yoshino Blossom. Ancient, Asian, and other unidentified scripts were found on the tree. Each text is made out of smaller texts that can only be viewed microscopically. The microscopic texts that can be translated have multiple repetitions of the words bridge and barrier. That's why I hypothesized that there might be an alien. Carlson finished his comprehensive report. Natasha absorbed both of her colleagues' reports. After a few seconds, she asked. All right, so what do we do next? We. Barton indicated both himself and Natasha, are going to keep finding that alien. Carlson's going to compile a report for Fury, then continue reading through witness statements. Barton finished. All right, let's go. Natasha said. She stood up and walked out of the door, followed by Barton and Coulson. Kamar Taj, Kathmandu, Nepal. March 30th, 2005, 12.45 H local. Ancient One. The three guests bowed down in front of her as a sign of respect. Good. You're all here. Have a seat. The Ancient One pointed to a Shibudai, with one sitting pillows on one side and three on the other. The table has a small basket of biscuits and a pot of tea. The Ancient One served everyone a cup of tea. Everyone took a sip of their drink as customary before she finally said. Let's get to business, shall we? The Ancient One said with her usual smile. Everyone in the room showed their agreement. Agreement. Let me start with the most important point first. Master Pangborn. Yes, Ancient One? Jonathan Pangborn straightened his back in attention. Jonathan Pangborn is a six feet, six feet two inches, medium built, thirty years old, Caucasian man, who came to Kamar Taj after an accident in the factory he worked for rendered him paralytic from the waist down. He came to Kamar Taj in hopes of being able to walk again as the same as many stories he heard. The Ancient One accepted him as a student and started his own journey in the way of the mystical arts. This allowed him to use his legs again. You're able to use your legs again in its fullest, am I right? The Ancient One asked. Pangborn nodded his head in affirmative. When are you planning to live the order, if I may ask? Of course, she already knew the answer due to the power of the eye, but the conversation would be more natural if Pangborn is the one who laid out his plans. Pangborn looked shocked for a moment as well as Kisilius and Mordo. The last of which felt betrayed that someone would willingly leave the order when they achieve their goals. Around a year from now, Master. Pangborn finally answered. Good. She said. 
This drew shocked expressions from the people in the room. They would have thought she would be against Pangborn leaving. But not good enough. I want you to leave immediately. It seems like this whole conversation would continue to shock them all. Nobody heard the Ancient One ask someone to live. May I ask why, Master? Pangborn asked with a shake in his voice due to nervousness. The Ancient One just smiled, enjoying drawing these reactions. Being centuries old, entertainment becomes a scarce resource. For your final mission, of course. She said. Pangborn drew a calming breath, hearing something to reassure him. He really wouldn't want to be on the Ancient One's wrong, wrong side. As you would leave the order anyway, I'm giving one last mission for you. I want you to gather information on anything or anyone that might seem strange, the more powerful, the better. You will be done, Master. May I ask why and when should I leave? Pangborn asked. Of course, you may ask, but I won't reveal the answer until I have identified who or what it is. The Ancient One said, losing her smile. As for when, I prefer if you leave as soon as possible. Maybe after the gathering. Bring your items with you, you won't have to go back here again unless I call for you. She answered. Pangborn stood up, bowed, and left, but before he could go far, the Ancient One added, find the yellow fox. It's the only clue I could find. Pangborn bowed again, and left to pack for his journey. Kecilius and Mordo are staring dumbfounded to the exchange. They guessed a similar conversation would happen with them. Now that's done. The Ancient One faced Kecilius. After the gathering, I want you to pour over our records for any mention of a yellow fox. She ordered. Kecilius is a six feet zero inches, broad-built, forty years old man who came to Kamar Taj with the help of Karl Mordo. Mordo introduces Kecilius to the Ancient One to help Kecilius understand the grief he acquired when he lost his son and his wife. As much as she hates it, the coming of Dormammu is an essential event in the future to make sure Strange would step up as the Sorcerer Supreme. The demon would need a follower from this world to weaken the shields, and the most likely candidate is still Kecilius. Ordering him to look into the library would lead him to encounter the history of Dormammu. His grief and discontent would draw him to the demon's power, and start the whole event. Yes, master. Kecilius nodded. The Ancient One waved her hand, indicating he is dismissed. Kecilius stood up and left. The Ancient One stared at Mordo. She was thinking about which approach would make him less likely to betray the Order in the future. Karl Mordo is one of the most promising students the Ancient One ever had. He's a 5 feet 10 inches, broad-built, 45 years old, African-English man. He came to Kamar Taj, hoping to acquire the power to file his revenge, but eventually found peace under the Ancient One's tutelage. Deciding on her plan, the Ancient One waved her hand, materializing a journal. This is one of my summarized journals. I write one every century I'm alive to keep track of the critical event. She placed the journal and slid it to Mordo's direction. I want you to read it. Ask any question, any time. I'll try to answer with the best of my ability. Showing him her choices from her point of view might lessen the chance of his betrayal in the future. His future is not clearly shown, since the yellow fox would somehow cross his path. Picking up the journal reverently, Mordo bowed deeply while still sitting down. Thank you for giving me the chance to read this, Master. Let me warn you. This does not mean you would be the next Sorcerer Supreme. I still TK your talents are better suited for other endeavors. I'd understand, Master. Mordo said while gritting his teeth lightly. The Ancient One has been telling him this for quite some time but he still doesn't understand why she doesn't want for him to take on the mantle. The Ancient One stood up and motioned him to follow her. It's time for the gathering. I'm quite excited to talk about the future. 
she said while smiling brightly.